Good afternoon, everyone. I'm Mason Williams. I'm a professor of leadership studies and political science here at Williams. And it is my pleasure to introduce and moderate today's panel, What It's Like to Do Journalism Today. And <laughs> I take it from the reaction there, there's no need to convince you that this is a, an interesting question right now. And a, this is a profound moment in the history of journalism in this country. And it's a moment where journalists are exercising a sort of obviously a very vitally important role. Um, and in which um, the practice of journalism is being buffeted by politics, um, but also by changing technologies and patterns of consumption which are transforming the industry. And sort of beneath this kind of daily furor of fake news and so forth, I think we're confronted by a set of contradictions. You know, one reads stories about a crisis of the media alongside reports of a golden age of journalism. And there are ways you could tell both those stories um, in a convincing fashion. You know, social media seems to offer a new civic sphere at some moments, but you know, on the other, and it might be producing filter bubbles which are going to lead to the death of the republic, you know? Um, you read stories about massive layoffs at some of the great American newspapers, um, but at the very same time there are vital new platforms being created. And I read the other day JSchool applications are up 10% at Columbia this year, 24% at Northwestern. Um, so people seem to think this is really important right now. So it's a confusing moment. Um, in journalism, but also a manifestly important one. And to help us better understand what it's like to do journalism today and what it might be like to do journalism tomorrow, we are very fortunate to have three leading practitioners from different parts of the industry. Um, seated uh, to your left is Lizzie O'Leary, uh, Williams class of 1998, who's the host of Marketplace <laughs> Weekend. <laughs> Happy reunion, all of you. <laughs> the host of Marketplace Weekend, um, beloved of my commute to get pancakes um, every weekend. Um, she, spent, she created Marketplace Weekend in 2014. Before that was a correspondent for CNN and Bloomberg TV. Um, and her reporting has appeared uh, on the BBC, PBS NewsHour, The New York Times, uh, The New York Times Magazine. And she's an adjunct professor at the Columbia U University Graduate School of Journalism. Um, also an alum. At Williams, uh, in addition to performing in the Frosh Review with fellow panelist Ben Money, uh, she served as a tour guide and, uh, have, we, have we verified this yet, uh, claims she can still name buildings on campus while walking backwards. So. Um, to her left in the middle is Ben Money, also class of 98. Ben is the Director of Global News and Publishing Partnership Solutions at Google. Um, prior to that, he earned an MS from the Columbia Graduate School of Journalism and an MBA from Columbia Business School uh, and worked in strategic planning and development in a variety of capacities for the New York Times. Not his least claim to fame is having served as Editor-in-Chief of the Williams Record. <laughs> Finally, J. David Goodman, Williams Class of 2003. is a staff reporter for the New York Times covering City Hall, New York City politics, and Mayor Bill de Blasio. Before that, uh, he reported on the New York Police Department, crime and criminal justice for the Times. He's also a graduate of Columbia's Graduate School of Journalism, received a Pulitzer Traveling Fellowship in 2009, and has written stories from Beijing, Bangkok, and Toronto, among other places. He lives in Jackson Heights, Queens with his wife and son, um, who are here. I just learned before coming on stage, all three JAs. <laughs> Interesting to start. Um, just by having each of you give uh, the audience a glimpse of what your um, daily work life is like. So um, perhaps each of you could just tell us a story about uh, either something you've reported or a project you've worked on recently. Um, that you think is particularly interesting and sort of maybe suggestive of where journalism is today and what went into it. Oh, okay. Um, I'll go first. Um, so I host a weekly show, and it is a pre-taped show. And the reason that is important is that it in 
informs the way I think about what we're going to give our audience every week. So that means I record my show on a Friday, and whatever stories we are going to share with you, number one, they got to be done by Friday. Number two, they have to be relevant and interesting to hold your attention throughout the weekend. And number three, they have to still be relevant if somebody gets indicted or you know, some sort of crazy thing happens on Friday at 5 p.m. <laughs> after we've already recorded. So what that has meant is certainly in the past year, um, and really even before that, we really leaned into original reporting. I am much more interested in reporting than commentary. Um, and so uh, I have a weird sideline in covering disasters and disaster response. Uh, so I took my team to Puerto Rico twice uh, after Hurricane Maria, once in the fall, uh, and then once again in April to create hour-long specials that really look at people's everyday lives, what kinds of policies dominate and dictate that, and kind of where the interaction of the choices we make about money and economics on a macro level interact with like how you get up and go to the store and feed your family and you know get medicine and all of those normal things that people try to do every day. Um, and so that is really what I do, which is like, what can I do that's different from all the chaos that's going on over here because I'm not covering the White House? And, and think about like, what value can I bring to people where they can trust that the reporting leads and is hopefully sort of revelatory in some way. Good. So I should say I'm not a journalist. Um, anymore. Any, <laughs> anymore. I went to journalism school with, uh, uh, with, with Lizzie. And, and as, as Mason said, I, I edited the college newspaper. But professionally, I've always been on the business side. Um, and, and I was at the New York Times for 10 years. And I ran our strategy consulting uh, team, helping us essentially make the transition from a print-centric news organization to a digital-centric uh, news organization that's very much reader first. Um, and so when I thought that organization was in good shape, uh, and it also happened to coincide with my 10 year anniversary there, I, I took a job at Google where I've been for the last two years. And, and I feel like there's a really interesting opportunity uh, for Google in particular, as well as the other platforms, uh, to acknowledge the role they play in disseminating high quality journalism information and hopefully you know, Im improve how that's done in a way that actually leads to uh, a, strength, uh, a stronger ecosystem for journalism overall. And, and one of the things that I, I did recently to answer your question um, was we launched this program, I think back in, oh, I guess I should say, I, I know this to a fact because I spent many, many hours working on it March 20th of this spring called the Google News Initiative. And it was an attempt to essentially really create a center of gravity uh, within Google as well as, frankly, in the, in, the, in the ecosystem as well about our commitment to uh, supporting journalism across our platforms, across um, other products and services, I'm really hoping to do two, th uh, three things. One, elevate quality journalism on our platforms in particular, but again, also on other platforms. Uh, two, helping to evolve business models. Everybody, I think, has read um, and is familiar with the fact that kind of the, the fundamental print-centric business model uh, where you have essentially a, a regional monopoly of, of attention and you can essentially support that with gobs and gobs of, of, of money from advertising, that's no longer the case. And, and digital advertising is, is no longer sufficient to be able to support a, a really high quality um, newsroom at scale. And so we've been trying to think through what are the other ways essentially we can help news organizations of all types, not just the New York Times or um, you know, their ilk, but you know, NPR, small local news organizations, even individuals, um, former reporters who are bringing the same kind of high quality um, reportage and, and editing skills to bear on kind of the accountability issues that are required for, I think, a, a healthy and functioning democracy. Uh, so we've been supporting subscriptions and other consumer revenue. And then uh, the third bit is just leveraging technology to help drive innovation and really helping the, uh, the culture of these organizations adapt so they can effectively uh, navigate what is an overwhelming uh, number of challenges that they're facing. Yeah. Okay. So um, I have sort of the most old school job, I think, of the people sitting up here. I cover City Hall. I work in a room called Room 9 um, in City Hall, which has been a place where uh, people have covered mayors of New York City for 100 years or more. There's a fireplace. It doesn't work anymore. But there's John Lindsay's cane is on the wall. I mean, there's all sorts of memorabilia from this long history of, of doing this. Um, but when I started at the Times, I, I got a job shortly after graduating through uh, various means and um, ended up working on the website. 
And so I kind of went backwards. I started on the digital side and moved to the print side as the whole paper was moving from, um, from print to digital. And when I started on the, on the, at the paper, the, um, the website was actually in a separate building completely. And you had to walk. It was like when people were going to the, the Times building, it was like a big deal. We're going to sort of the citadel of where everyone is sort of making the journalism. And we were in this little place. And it, was, it had a startup feel. And on Halloween, I remember people would wear costumes. And like a, you know, a big banana was uh, doing the website. And you know, there was a scooter to get around. And, and, but I, and I like that, but I, I, wanted to, um, I wanted to sort of write, and I always sort of thought of myself as a, as, um, as a writer, so you know, that would be something that I'd like to do. And so, um, but the way into it was I noticed that um, at that time, the website made something called audio slideshows, which are essentially defunct now, but were, because websites didn't load as quickly, you couldn't do video, but you could do pictures with audio. And so the Times had very good pictures, and you could interview a subject, and then they would narrate underneath it. And so I would pitch, you know, I'll do an audio slideshow for this article that someone else has written. And then slowly I'd say, well, I'd do this article and an audio slideshow. And some of the less served, uh, you know, uh, sections were interested in, in having that. So I kind of weaseled my way onto the um, reporting staff that way. Um, I've been covering now, I started in the police department, which is another sort of old school um, beat that's existed forever. And then to City Hall. And just the thing that happened, you asked about something recent. I mean. Um, you know, the way news gets made in, in City Hall now is, is very much like news, I think, has always gotten made at City Hall. Like, for example, uh, yesterday, um, so a big issue in New York City right now, and many of you may know this, is whether to support um, uh, half-price metro cards for um, low-income New Yorkers. And there's been a big debate over whether to do that between the um, legislative side and the mayor. And so as I'm walking into City Hall, I just so happen to run into someone uh, that I know. And we're just sort of talking, and then I go through, we go through the metal detector, and he says, oh, I have something for you. you know, they have an agreement on uh, paying for the mayor and, and the, the council president, or um, speaker, have, a, have an agreement. And, and, you know, but he's, he's not a source that I can use directly. And so then so the question of then trying to firm up that information with different people, and uh, eventually then we have a story that did run today, but it also included a, a absolute denial from the mayor's side, um, <laughs> which, but earlier in the day, it wasn't an absolute denial. It was a, I have no reaction to that, which actually is very telling, you know, and it, <laughs> these dynamics are, are, it's all about parsing words and it's about the reading and, and knowing the characters and how does this person normally express himself versus how are they expressing themselves now in terms of getting confidence. And um, without going into too much detail, it sort of worked its way into a story that we, were, we felt comfortable with even though um, they hadn't actually shook hands on the deal. And in fact, but, but one way you knew it was true is that um, the mayor, before we ran the story, um, his spokesman comes into room nine and says, the mayor was supposed to go to Boston. And for those of you who don't know much about our mayor, he's a big Red Sox fan because he grew up in Cambridge, which much to the chagrin of New Yorkers. And so <laughs> he was going to the US Conference of Mayors in Boston. And it just so happens that the Red Sox were in town this weekend. <laughs> he was going to catch a game. So his spokesman was excited about that two days ago. And then he comes in uh, yesterday and says, oh, he's not going to Boston now. And I was like, that's funny, because I just asked them about the story. So he cancels his trip to Boston, then he takes down the rest of his schedule for the evening, then he, he, said, he essentially calls in sick for his weekly radio show the next day, and he's been sort of holed up since the story, and then others match the story as well, broke yesterday. So you know, it was just that one little interaction with someone that I knew that became this you know, thing that changed essentially. We ruined the mayor's weekend is what we did. <laughs> <laughs> de Blasio's term limited, that's why it can be seen at Fenway now. That's right. <laughs> so uh, the title of the panel is what it's like to do journalism today. And I thought one way to sort of get some purchase on that might be kind of thinking in terms of a, a bit of a sort of longer term perspective. So I'm, I'm curious to hear how each of you um, would reflect on how the industry has changed since you started your careers. Um, and uh, you know, what's that, what that's meant for how you do your work. You know, one thing that's funny is so my show is actually coming to the end of its production run at the end of the month. And so I've been thinking a lot about what I'm going to do next. And I've been at Marketplace for five years. And suddenly, there are all of these things that I can think about as my next job that did not exist five years ago. You know, mostly, frankly, that, that are podcasts and sort of direct delivery of the news to your phone. Uh, you know, I mean, I know you know this, people are tailoring things to, you know, we have whole teams that are thinking, well, how do we interface with Alexa and what do we deliver in the, you know, in the most sort of robust way so that it's part of a smart home? So, so that's one part of it. You know, on the other hand, I do also teach at Columbia and 
right now I'm just advising master's theses, but I've also taught the basic reporting and writing class, the incoming class, and it is really scary to say like, okay, now you're gonna try and get a job. When I graduated from Columbia, I sent out I think 70 resumes and nobody called me back. Um, and it's worse now. It's worse in a very consolidated way. Um, it's extremely expensive. And the sort of the barriers to entry are higher. I think there are a lot of really cool things happening, but like getting onto that first rung is very, very difficult. And, you know, there are these myths that we tell ourselves about the golden age of journalism. I'm like, yeah, but it's like Joe Pulitzer started a war, you know, like people made things up before, did kind of crooked stuff that. There is no perfect era of journalism, but I would, I would say that, that there's all this cool stuff happening here. The way to jump onto that train is a lot more difficult. Yep. And I think, um, definitely echo what, what Lizzie said, I, I think the interesting thing about what's good about t today in the state of journalism is there are many more voices included in um, the conversation. Um, you don't have, you know, back. I'm, I'm exaggerating, but you know, in the 50s, essentially, you know, three main networks, essentially, and a handful of major national newspapers and strong uh, local city uh, newspapers, essentially, kind of telling a singular story that mapped to the kind of uh, narrative of the, the most powerful people in, in society. And what we have today is, you know, with the platforms Twitter, Facebook, Google, and, and many others, um, so many more voices. Obviously, what that means is you can, as a consumer of that, be drowned out with those voices and not necessarily know how to navigate. So this notion of a common kind of narrative for society is a little bit lost, and a common, common uh, notion of, of facts, I think you were going to talk about that, that's a little lost as, as well. Um, I think, you know, culturally, and this is just my personal experience, you know, it's very similar to, to yours because we worked at the, the same place. And I went, I worked in the main building, you know, the, the original building of the, the Times, actually the se second building where we occupied it from 1900 to probably, I think, 2006. And it was like walking into, um, you know, it was walking into a temple. And, you know, the, the, the library there was oak paneled and stained glass, probably like some of the buildings here at, at Williams. And, you know, that spoke to a deep tradition and love for, for journalism. Um, now, you know, you still have that. It just manifests itself really differently. You know, the editors of X, Y, and Z publication are coming out to uh, Silicon Valley and getting a sense of, you know, how does Google do it? How does Facebook do it? Um, they're really thinking about uh, the whole kind of ecosystem. And, and, you know, journalism is now one of many things that they need to be thinking about alongside, you know, consumer demand. How do you map your, uh, dis you know, your content strategy to your distribution strategy to your audience? And you know, there's a question in my mind as to what the implication is. Uh, does it lead to better stories that actually create more value? Or is it essentially you know, becoming a little bit uh, more inclined to, I don't want to use the word pandering, but it's essentially more audience driven in a way that potentially loses its sense of import? Yeah, no, I mean, just to um, piggyback on what you're saying, it's, when you're talking about the, the difference in the buildings, I mean, in the new building, um, it was different when, when they first built it, and it's even more different today. They just um, did a complete renovation of the inside of the newsroom. And um, part of the reason for that was that they're trying to consolidate so we don't rent as much space, so we can spend more money on journalism and not on rent. Um, but what that means is that they've packed in a lot more people in these uh, smaller cubicles. But then they made this big area, it was like a little cafeteria in the main part of the newsroom that didn't exist there before, but it's meant to sort of encourage people to mingle. There's more sort of shared workspaces. The, Page one room, and probably this is the, the best example, the page one room used to be a big boardroom table with the chairs on the, uh, along the sides. And now they've taken that away, and it's couches. And they're, they're like low gray couches, and I think maybe they're red pillows or something. But it's, it's very odd. I mean, I haven't actually gone to a page one meeting. And I'm not sure they've started doing them in this room yet, but um, they're going to soon if they haven't. I haven't been to one um, in a long time. But just that sort of atmosphere and trying to kind of flatten everything out. And they put it into a glass walled space as well. So they're trying to communicate. Um, you know, and be a workspace that younger journalists want to work in and don't get lost to Silicon Valley or don't get lost to Vox or to BuzzFeed, you know, that people would want to um, see the times as something very sort of um, progressive. And it's, it's interesting. I mean, there's this um, Showtime documentary that's on now called The Fourth Estate. I don't know if anyone's been watching it, but, you know, it's, it tracks the uh, Trump administration's first year. And it's all about how the Times reporters are covering it. And this is a, 
idea that was essentially anathema, I think, to the New York Times maybe even five years ago, but certainly 10 or 20 years ago, that we would be the story, that you would want to be. I mean, long ago, there were no bylines at all. But you know, the idea that the reporters themselves, and uh, I think in the last 10 years, we've moved towards more first-person accounts. You see that people will write um, you know, in the first person on the front page, not just in accounts of how they do their job. Um, there's a whole line called Times Insider that is actually quite popular. Um, I think you have to be a subscriber to see it, but you know, you're asked to write about something that you did yourself. And, and I actually I find that very compelling. I think most people find that sort of yeah. uh, inside view you know, um, very um, engaging, and it gets you into a story in a different way. But it just wasn't the thing that Times reporters did, and I think it took a lot of convincing. But um, uh, when I started, as, like, as I said, I worked on the website, and it was essentially a non-professional group of young people that were hired because they were young and seemed to understand the internet in some way. And, <laughs> and I mean, uh, my connection was that via circuitous means, I'd played music at Williams and then ended up giving guitar lessons in France and ended up teaching an editor at the Herald Tribune guitar and ended up getting a job that way and then worked on the website there and the website at the Times. And so I came in that way. Uh, but now the, the website staff is like incredibly professionalized. Mm -hmm. They're very, you know, the, the folks that I, almost everyone that I started out with has either, either moved on or, or, or is doing something else. And they hire in um, people that have like, not just, not just digital experience, but deep journalistic experience. You know, everywhere it's much more rigorous. And um, it's just, it's, it's sort of amazing how, and I actually think, you know, to your point, we are trying to get more attuned to what audiences want, but at the same time, I don't think that's really caused the journalism itself to suffer. I think sometimes we make choices that, you know, they're experimenting, and there's this atmosphere of experimentation that didn't exist before, essentially. Yeah. Uh, curious how, how you all think about um, the press itself becoming <laughs> the center of attention in the last few years. Um, you know, what, what sorts of you know, anxieties so has, this, has this caused you? Yeah. <laughs> I mean, it's, so I'll be really honest. It's hard in some ways. Like, uh, some of you I know follow me on Twitter and have seen me <laughs> interact with people. I, I actually think there is great value in transparency in, in, a, in an era where like truth is this squishy commodity in terms of showing what we do and showing why we do it and how we do it. On the other hand, being a female journalist on the internet is rough. I have gotten rape threats. I have gotten death threats. Um, and I am very lucky. One of David's colleagues, who I know well, gets just more junk than I could ever imagine. Um, but you know, the most threatened I've ever been has not been part of this experience at all. You know, I've, I've had a couple like people physically threaten me, and, but that was not covering this stuff. That's just doing the job. So there's that. But then the other part is like, it is, I think there's something anathema to doing the job of this sort of like, this is this really important moment for the press and we've got to bear down the future of democracy. Is it's, it's like, shut up. <laughs> just do your job. Make a phone call, make another phone call, try to figure out if the information you have is accurate, and keep going. And it's very hard to kind of hold those two things at the same time because, you know, on the one hand, anytime I see anyone attack the profession, I want to like jump in and defend it. On the other hand, I'm like, oh, come on, it's really not about us. Yeah, no, I mean, I, I um, sorry to jump in, but I do think that it's very bothersome when the story becomes you. And that's happened actually, in politicians, I think it's very beneficial to them because I think, you know, Congress might be down here, but the press is like just above. It's not yeah. as if people like the press. And so when you're talking about yourself and um, you're just, you're sort of losing, I think. And, and what people come to newspapers for, unless you're a journalist yourself, is to read a story, not to read um, about the journalists, them, you know, uh, in their own sort of sensitivities. And so, um, and, and this was sort of um, driven home to me. The, um, the mayor has had a very uh, bad relationship <laughs> with the press. And I know where so this is going. He, uh, <laughs> so he, he then, he's had various different kinds of um, uh, lash out moments. But the most recent one was a couple weeks ago where he actually came into this room, nine room in City Hall. And he had been uh, sort of outed from a, 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 a freedom of information request for his emails that he was bad-mouthing this and that reporter and saying like he wouldn't mind if the Daily News 
went online only, and the New York Post completely folded. And um, so all this very callous stuff for a mayor to be caught saying. And he fought in court to have that protected, and it turned out they weren't protected emails. And so when it finally came out, it's, he requested to come and talk to us in um, room nine. And we thought, oh, he's going to make amends, or we'll have like a heart to heart. And <laughs> that's not what happened. Um, but, <laughs> What's funny, too, is just to give you a visual of this, Room 9, when you walk into it on the left, are only, and I haven't done this, other reporters did this, but our, our front pages are the woods of the Daily News and the Post when they've put the mayor on the wood for something negative. So you have probably 30 <laughs> pictures of him in various, you know, photoshopped, the one as a baby in a high chair, you know, there's all, all sorts of things. So he, <laughs> and so his people, uh, you know, and the TV cameras were there for when he came in, so they really were wanted to put him in front of the white door and not in front of the... <laughs> <laughs> thing. So you can understand why he might not like the press, but... Will you say the email about you? What's that? The email about you. What email about didn't me? Didn't he write one about you, too? He didn't write oh. one. He said things to me, personally, but he didn't write one about me. Th th these emails were before I started covering him, but um, I'm sure there are others that I don't know about. Um, but, he, but so he didn't come to apologize. He came to essentially double down and say that we were all corporate media and that... Um, you know, we couldn't, we didn't represent essentially um, fairly the views of, of New Yorkers was the kind of um, meat of what he was saying. And I think that's absolutely untrue, but I also don't think that we win by having that argument. And I think that he's, you know, and, and Trump as well have, a, have sort of tuned into something that is uh, important is that if you're paying, if the press is fighting, if you're fighting the press about whether they're doing their jobs or not, and they're defending themselves, you're kind of winning, because on the side, you're doing other stuff. And, and the actual meat of these emails that got disclosed were, was not that he was bad-mouthing the press. It's that he had a very cozy relationship with the guy who had a lot of business before the city. And so he, he had brought this guy into a lot of very high-level um, communications inside City Hall. And that was the uh, a sensible mean, reason for suing over these emails. But once they came out, this stuff was so delicious, it became the story. And then he, instead of having to answer questions about that, ended up fighting us over. And, and we defended and said, we're not corporate media. And it was this whole big thing. And, but that, the actual reason and the real meat of the story got lost in this. And it, I think that only benefited the mayor. I wanted to pick up on something um, Ben said a moment ago about how the media landscape is at once becoming much more inclusive, but also information seems to be getting fractured. Um, shortly after he left office, Barack Obama gave this interview with David Letterman for his new show. He um, said, one of the challenges our democracy faces is that we operate in different informational universes. Um, you know, there's no sort of common baseline of facts anymore. Now, I heard that and spent some time talking with my students about it um, uh, in a class I was teaching this spring. Uh, and, you know, they, they were very quick to unpack what the problems would have been with the... Uh, you know, the you know, straight white man reading you the news every night, right? Um, so I, I'm curious how you all are thinking about this. Um, is there a way uh, to sort of recapture some sort of shared civic space, um, you know, without giving up the very real gains that have been realized as, um, through the processes that have been outlined? I, I'm not a, a journalist, so I always have to caveat this. Uh, the, the, this is just me as, I guess, a, a layperson, but the, the thing that um, is interesting to me there is that, you know, journalism, this can't all be at the, laid at the feet of, of journalism, meaning the lack of a common narrative. Um, you know, there's, there's a common narrative and then there's kind of shared facts, and, and the lack of a kind of common narrative is a function of, like, the kind of fragmentation and, and lack of power of major institutions, religion, you know, um, you know community organizations, local newspapers and, and the like, and I'm not sure that it's necessarily the, the, the job, so to speak, of, of press to create a common narrative. I think that the job of the press should be about, you know, again, holding truth to account, and um, again, but the, the journalists can speak more effectively ab about that. Um, I will say, I guess coming, one of the things that's appealing about Google to me is um, it's, unlike other platforms, it's essentially built on this notion of open, and this notion is that any, anyone um, can contribute content, can actually put it up on the open web on the internet and you know, make money off of it and, and reach audiences. And I think there's an element to this which is very beautiful about, about the internet to the extent that it can be preserved. And I, I think we should be thinking about the fact that on YouTube, you know, people who otherwise you know, just didn't have uh, you know, any way and would feel completely alone to connect to people now are able to essentially communicate and create uh, communities around uh, you know, uh, social groups, um, gender groups, and, and the like that otherwise didn't exist. 
So I'd like to kind of think about how do we preserve and, and magnify those things while also making sure there's, you know, there is the appropriate corrective, so to speak, in, in facts, in the kind of institutions and the professional uh, values and ethos of, of journalism. Right, because the, the trouble with that openness is that, like, aren't, aren't some of the most popular channels on YouTube sort of alt-right men, young men talking to each other, sort of incels and other folks that, you know, have a very, um, you know, I think bad effect on the general conversation, right? And there used to be this idea, and the one, you know, you don't, you wouldn't want to go back to a situation where you have sort of three um, voices of authority talking to everyone, but there used to be more of a sphere of sort of unacceptable, um, you know, uh, topics for debate that wouldn't enter into it. Like we wouldn't, uh, folks who had, you know, racist views wouldn't even be allowed into the, the conversation. And suddenly we have that because the walls have sort of broken down around everything. And so I think it's, uh, I don't know how you put that genie back in the bottle. I mean, uh, if I did, I would make a lot of money, I think. But I, I think what we have to do is, is make sure that we are really standing by what is true and, and are very steadfast in defending that and without being defensive ourselves, as I was saying before. I mean, I think you need to, be putting out as much true information into the world and then trying to correct the things that are, that are untrue and, and being as powerful a voice for that as you can. And, and I think that every time there's a, a scandal that affects you know, the Times or another journalistic institution, every time there's a story that gets undercut or isn't true, uh, it, it hurts us and it helps uh, the folks that, would spread, that don't care if the information they put out is factual or not because they have agendas um, one way or the other. And I think, um, so I think it's very dangerous. I think our job is to be as, as careful as we can so that we're not undercutting our own mission by, by helping um, folks that, that don't care if, if, um, if things are real or not. Yeah, and I would just say that, sorry, the, uh, the notion of, uh, I mean, the responsibility is for the people creating the, the journalism to essentially stand by the facts and then the organizations who are responsible for kind of aggregating audiences and distributing that journalism to signal to users what is and what isn't you know, most relevant, most trustworthy, mm -hmm. et, et cetera. And that's a lot of the work, at least, that, that we've been doing over the last uh, couple of years and obviously can do a lot more. And there's a real question to me of um, you know, what's the right level of, of um, I mean, how do you essentially measure effectiveness here when there's not, you don't want, I, I wouldn't want any institution, um, like a platform to determine what is acceptable right. conversation versus what isn't. So who governs that? How does that get governed? Is it kind of from the people on the platform? Mm -hmm. Just what Facebook is trying to do? Is it some kind of algorithm? Is it the third party board? Mm -hmm. um, is it a professional organization? I think that's one of the things that organizations like you know, all of us represent are, are struggling through and how do we think about that as an ecosystem overall in a way that doesn't lean towards censorship? I think I, for me when I think about this, it, the ideal is a marriage of expertise and, and valuing expertise and realizing that it is hard won and it is important and reflecting honest experiences. I mean, every single one of us sitting up here is white. Most newsrooms in America are extremely white that is not reflective of the current American experience. On the other hand, I have deep expertise in covering certain things. So it, it's this, and, you, and I think you can sort of take those two pillars and go places with them and say like, I have a real experience in covering economic issues so I can sit here and know like, yes, that makes sense, no, that doesn't make sense. But let me actually sit here and listen to you and hear what your world is like and genuinely be curious about it. You know, I come at this without the thinking about it as an industry and more thinking about it as sort of like, if I am reflecting back to you something that feels right in your bones and seems aligned with what you can see every day, you're more likely to trust me and you're more likely to take my word about whatever the next thing is. And I, you know, that's why the decline of local news drives me crazy because if you're watching the news about your own hometown, you have a pretty good sense of whether that's, you know, accurate or not. So I don't know, it's, it's somewhere in kind of holding those two things together and hopefully finding the Venn diagram between them. So we have some time for questions. The only ground rule here is you're not allowed to ask David why your Sunday newspaper is late. <laughs> <laughs> and I have nothing to do with NPR sponsorships whatsoever. I don't know anything about them. <laughs> sure. Um, like many of us retirees in this room, uh, I'm a, uh, a cable news junk. And uh, we've seen um, reporters jump from the front page of the Times or the Post 
and appear almost in rock star fashion every night to defend or, or expound in an editorial fashion on the news program. I'm thinking of Michelle Goldberg, Acosta, The Washington Post, etc. What do you guys think of all this stuff that we've gone in our, in our society from cooks to celebrity chefs, and now we've gone from reporters who are usually anonymous, not being editor, um, you know, representing the editorial board? who now are like the legitimate face of your newspaper and the only ones that most of us will see. Yeah, I think. <laughs> oh. Um, uh, journalists becoming sort of media personalities, right? Um, yeah, what do we make of this? Well, I mean, I think the challenge is what we were talking about before is that, um, again, in the past we wouldn't have wanted, at least at the times, to become part of the story, but now it's almost like every opportunity to essentially extend the brand, to get out there and, and you know, by, you know, you know who Michelle Goldberg is, is now, you know, maybe you didn't before, I'm not saying that's a good thing, but, you know, she's out there talking about it. She actually happens to be an opinion columnist, so you wouldn't, I wouldn't want her to represent to most people that that's what the time stands for, because she represents her But I think opinion. the casual viewer just sees Michelle Goldberg, New York Times. That's right, no, yeah. and I think it's, I think it's problematic. Um, but, I, I mean, I think it's more interesting and more challenging to have the um, reporting staff out there, and you see, you know, political reporters on Morning Joe and and elsewhere co constantly appearing on CNN. A lot of people that used to work um, in Room Nine who I know who are then it's like, oh, there's you know Josh on TV now, and he's talking about his story. And I think they're very careful to stick to the facts of their stories. But I agree with you that it's it gets to be people ignore the actual story and stick to what's being said on TV, and that can be kind of flattening and re reductive to what the actual reporting has showed in a lot of situations. Yeah. I would also say it's cheap. Hmm. And that is one of the most I mean, frust cheap, how inexpensive cheap for the in, No, I mean, it's yeah. inexpensive. Yeah. It's actually, <laughs> that, as someone who has been in a, a CNN correspondent, it's way less expensive to stick David on television talking about the thing that he did than it is to actually fund an investigation it, and send a camera crew and you know, multiple sound people and a researcher and a producer and da da da. And it's terrifying to me. If you walk away with anything from this, is please pay for news. Please pay for news. The erosion. Mm -hmm. Local news too, not Local just Local news, the erosion <laughs> of news, I believe, is directly linked to thinking of it as, as a product of value. Back here? Hi. Hi, Maya. <laughs> so I'm looking at a headline um, sent by my brother and sister from our home state of Colorado, actually from the New York Times, but about our home state of Colorado, about the Denver Post rebels against its hedge fund ownership, right? So for those who don't know, this is where the reporters took over their opinion section and rose against their um, New York-based hedge fund, which I thought was great, you know, that they did this, we, you know, so it was a good example of kind of them becoming, making themselves the news. Um, my brother works there on the ad side, he's nine years younger on the digital ad side, and he, you know, everyone is worried about their jobs, and we're of course worried about, what Lizzie's saying, kind of, can this now one remaining local paper continue? So I'm just curious, like, what is the, what are the economics that are going to make this work besides getting everyone to continue <laughs> buying their paper. You know, is it like some benefactor really has to come in and, and support this to make it work? Or, uh, because I, how they can't fund the investigative journalism that they used to do now with slashing 30 people, you know, here and then 30 people there. So what, what is the answer to making it work? Because, I mean, I still get my Sunday Times even though I don't read <laughs> most of it because I'm not gonna, you know, really stop paying for it. But. That's not a I mean, I think it kind of lies in what, a lot yeah, of what you're doing. Yeah, I mean, I, w I was, do we repeat the question? I think oh, the question sorry. was, what's the, f what's the fundamental economic model that's going to be able to support journalism going, going forward? Um, I, I mean, I, I'll speak to what I did at the Times and obviously what I'm trying to do and, and what we're trying to do at Google. Um, I, I'll, I'll start by saying there's not one, I don't think there's going to be one answer. Um, I think we've seen a lot of success, and, and I'm happy about this because um, this is kind of one of my projects for many years, um, but in, in getting people to pay for news. Um, and you know, the, the challenge right now is that people are paying for 
uh, news from only a handful of you know, national um, uh, republications. So there's a question of, is there going to be a winner-take-all um, dynamic there, which could be good if the New York Times and Washington Post and, and Wall Street Journal and the like um, you know, extend their journalism to more local markets. Um, but that's probably fairly far out there. Um, we've also seen really exciting models in, in terms of nonprofit um, and foundation-supported journalism. So folks probably recognize ProPublica, um, which started, I don't know how many reporters they have, 100 or 200. Um, you know, but they're essentially partnering with existing news organizations to do investigative work. Um, Jill over there is on the board of Chalkbeat, which is an organization that um, focuses on a, a niche education reporting, uh, nonprofit supported. And there are other vertical uh, nonprofit and foundation supported programs, which I actually think hold a lot of promise because they don't have the baggage of uh, a print newspaper economic model and a lot of the debt and cash requirements that that, that entail. Um, and then you've got kind of really interesting regional and local based uh, nonprofit organizations like the Vermont Digger. Um, which covers that area, Texas Tribune, which covers state houses in, 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 in Texas and I think has more um, state reporters than probably any um, equivalent publication. But you're also going to need to see more uh, changes at the platform side um, on the advertising model and on the consumer model to essentially help uh, the folks who are maybe potentially going to be left behind. Um, and ultimately, it is going to come down to a combination of individual users paying for content in some way, shape, or form. So to use a little bit of industry jargon, it's moving away from the attention economy, which is publishers making money uh, from users spending time with their content, um, essentially selling ads against that time, to a value economy, where publishers and, and news creators are creating things that individual consumers actually are willing to pay for. Um, and that became one of the big mantras at, at the times before we left, which is like, or I left. Um, you need to essentially do something that people are going to want to pay money for, um, because that essentially speaks to the fundamental value um, and the fact that you know ultimately this is something that everybody here um, needs to derive value from. So uh, there's no one answer, but I think there's an excitement. And I do think there's a a recognition, certainly post election, that the sort of fractured urban, rural, where do people live, where do they get their news, uh, among news organizations, that, I mean, it's small, but you know, I think about something we did called the Marketplace Hub, where we picked four different um, local public radio stations and partnered with them. One's in Orlando, one's in Cleveland, one's in Houston, one's in Pittsburgh. And OK, those are all, those are all big cities, but they're all in different parts of the country. And we give money and resources to reporters in those stations, and they take their work and their fascinating stories and put, you know, put them on a national platform. And we think, like, all right, what's the thing we haven't thought of next? Like, what's the thing that you know, we can do? Um, it doesn't answer Maya's question about the very specific hedge fundy private equity part of this, and we can talk about that later. I mean, it, you, you're, you're mentioning this. It reminds me, there's, newspapers aren't the only source of local journalism. You've obviously got radio, NPR, and... and, and uh, You've got you know, local television broadcasting companies, which actually are fairly profitable at this point. You may see changes in, I mean, hopefully there's changes in some of the kind of ownership rules. So you can see essentially the kind of consolidation of, of media markets or media um, outlets and in individual markets that actually will create you know, a sustainable newsroom that can make money and essentially you know, do what they should be doing, which is accountability reporting. Um, you know, there's a lot of experiments ongoing. No one um, clear path to success. but Hopefully, I think we'll be able to find something probably in the next five, say, 15 to 20 years, I was going to suggest. So it's a while out. Unattributed sources. David mentioned uh, running into a friend of his, and then he couldn't use the name of the source. Uh, uh, you'll read an article in the Times, for example, and it says uh, a person close to uh, this uh, particular topic, someone who was knowledgeable about this issue. I always suspected. Uh, first, the question is, are there any clues that you can gather from reading the article as to who the source is? I always personally suspected the first name that you read and the paragraph immediately following. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> um, that's that's uh, good detective work. That's not, no. that's not, that's not true. Um, <laughs> so... <laughs> I will actually say, just to dispel, it's, it's interesting that you say that because the rule actually is, to the extent that there is a rule, and all these things are essentially norms, right? I mean, there's no, 
Uh, yeah, like nobody enough. knows what off the record means. <laughs> right. Even people that deal with it constantly, you, I always talk about what I understand this to mean is this. I'm going to use it this way and et cetera. But to your question, um, generally the accepted practice at the times for anonymous sources um, is that you don't then name them elsewhere in the story. Because I think that's doing a disservice to readers. If, you, if you're referring to one person, one bit of information anonymously, and then you're letting that person speak on the record elsewhere, that is essentially playing a trick on the reader. And I think that shouldn't be done. I think it is done in some places. It, it uh, is not done in the Times, at least, it, you know, I don't do it and it's not supposed to be done. I mean, I can't say it's never been done. Um, but so there are sort of norms and rules about how you approach that. Generally, when someone is unnamed, it's because they can't be named. Um, but the information is uh, important enough that we've, uh, you know, need to get it out there. And, and there's been, as you probably know, a lot of hemming and hawing over this over the years. And they've tried to really restrict it. And in fact, um, the top level editors have to approve all anonymous sources. So the people that I was mentioning before, I had to, you know, I tell my editor, then he goes and tells someone. And so if someone knows who everybody is. Um, you know, when Trump says, oh, they make up their sources, uh, that's not true. And it's, you know, it's very, un it undermines um, the notion that, um, that most of sort of important journalism is based on, which is that, you know, there are people that have important information that will be punished if they uh, were to talk about it. Um, but that it would, you know, serve society and, and readers to have it out there. And so. Can I? The corollary to, the, to my first question is, how, <clears throat> when somebody gives you a tip, how many other sources do you have to corroborate it with? Is there a particular hard to pass number? No, not at all. I mean, it depends on, it all depends on who the person is and how close they are, right? That's the sort of calculation you're trying to make. Like, what is the information? Who's the person who told you? And how close are they to that information that they're telling you? Are they, did they generate the information, right? If, if someone's telling me a story about what they did, um, but they want to, you know, tell it to me in a certain fashion, that gives me a lot of confidence that at least that, that's their version of events. If someone's telling me what, you know, it's essentially hearsay, you need to get closer. So you're trying to get to someone in the room when the, the stuff happened. Um, a lot of times, especially in political reporting, it's the two, there's maybe two or four people who are in the room, but they then brief their staff. And so if you can get as close to the staff that got briefed, then you're pretty close if you can't get the principles. So, but it's all about getting as close as possible. And you always want to try and get someone on the record. And in political reporting, everyone wants to be off the record. Or not off the record, but they want to be anonymous because um, it just causes them less headache. And so it's all about trying to push people when you can to, to you know, I mean, spokespeople want to be anonymous. It's Which ridiculous. Which is absurd because so. it's, it's, their, yeah. it's their literal job. Yeah. <laughs> so the, the one thing that I would like to add to this, because I think it does a huge disservice to readers and... The Trump administration does this, the Obama administration did this, and the Bush administration did this. I haven't covered the Trump administration that much, but I covered both the Obama and Bush White Houses. Organized background briefings, Chloe, I'm sorry about this, are bullshit. <laughs> and they are corrosive to democracy, and they undermine a reader's faith in a reporter. I think it is absolutely terrible and it is a practice that is just endemic to Washington. You'll be like, well, the president will come out and say something, and then a senior administration official will come like, tell a room full of 20 people about something. And I don't know how to fix it, because like, reporters have you know, mortgages and childcare too. And if you're not in the room, your competitor's going to be in the room, and your editor's going to be really angry if you say, like, eh, sorry, I walked out of the briefing because the rules were stupid. But it makes it very difficult for you, the reader, to know what was something David worked for and got someone to tell him when maybe they shouldn't have, and who, or who was a, like a legitimate whistleblower, and who was the undersecretary of state who decided to come out and tell 20 people the same thing. And if you see senior administration official and senior administration official, it's really hard for you, the news consumer, to know what's what. And I think actually this is where the conversation about the uh, fracturing of the media landscape and the sort of uh, existential crisis in media uh, dovetails with the mission of media, which is that it used to be that news organizations were quite powerful in the face of uh, government, right. and you could actually force people onto that. You could force that kind of interaction to happen in a certain way. You say, well, we're not going to cover this, and so therefore uh, you're not going to get your news out. And now the administrations have so up many other outlets to go to, or just their own ways of getting their information out. They don't need the media, and so the weakened state of the media actually is detrimental to getting government to sort of own up to the things that it's doing, essentially. Here. <laughs> <laughs> uh, 
I'm John Stickney, and my <coughs> wife and I just retired from the failing New York Times. <laughs> and <laughs> she was refused a buyout twice, just so you know. <laughs> She's probably the greatest honor in American journalism. Uh, we're witnessing a phenomenon where a president commands a platform and essentially directs a news agenda. My question is, do you think President Trump is a good writer? <laughs> <laughs> Everyone needs an editor. Financial <laughs> <laughs> uh, Times said 80% uh, of North America is illiterate financially. And in all the debates, and I never hear any numbers mentioned. For example, what was the cost of the Afghan Iraq war? Two to three trillion dollars. It was financed with borrowed money. Student loans outstanding, 1.2 trillion. Oh Affordable housing, you could fix that with 40 billion. And the point I'm getting at is, therefore, the candidates and the people are not held accountable. They have no knowledge of the numbers. They're talking about all these other issues. When the basic issue is jobs, we spend twice as much on health care now as we do on education. It used to be reversed. But nobody puts these numbers down. And so I'm wondering, I guess my question is, do the journals and the press, do you feel uncomfortable financially? Personally, or like on a... <laughs> no, 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 it's a serious question. No, I'm, I'm right. actually not trying to be flip. Yeah. I mean, I, I, this is what I cover, and I, with all due respect, one of the things that I find incredibly frustrating, I made a two-part series for Frontline in the news hour about student debt and about Navient, which is the largest debt servicer in the country, um, and you know a, a, a lawsuit, and we had him on tape suggesting that a guy should go live in his car so that he could make his loan payments, and nobody cared, and it was it's really frustrating. Um, I don't know the answer because, on the one hand, you are. Absolutely right. This is what we should talk about. This, the most important stuff is sort of how we invest our you know, blood, sweat, toil, and tears. And yet people are like, yeah, but I want to vote for someone who I prefer to sit down and have a beer with. And those two things are not always, but sometimes in opposition. We have failed on that because we like process stories. We like conflict stories. We give you sexy, fun stuff because it sells ads, and people click on it, and they read it. It is detrimental to democracy. Yeah. And he had numbers in there about what it would cost, how to finance it, and he had some very interesting ideas. Innovative ideas solve these problems. And to me, that's an important, you know, you can have the other articles, but this is this is important stuff that people should know. There are a lot of, you know, well-educated people that, you know, they don't know the numbers. And what happened to them? And I guess the thing that uh, upsets me the most, or not upset me, then the people who are on there are not held to rigorous standards. <coughs> you want to talk about the war? How much is it going to cost? How are you going to finance it? Who are they going to do it? What is it going to take care of from other places? What is the opportunity cost, etc.? This is relevant information, whether people want to read about it or don't worry. I would just interject and say I think this is um, you know, a job for citizens just as much as for journalists. Yeah. Um, uh, I have been missing folks in the balcony. Um, last okay, last question. Um, maybe we can get two quick ones in and you all take it um, however you want. Okay. okay, so obviously 
politics has become polarized, and uh, unfortunately, that the time truth has become polarized. We're seeing things like uh, recently Elon Musk is planning to do that cop thing, like, kind of satirical what he was suggesting, but essentially crowdsourcing truth was, was his solution for this. <laughs> that sounds horrible to me. I'd like to hear what the experts think about that, but also just how do we depolarize truth going forward? To some extent, it would be great. <laughs> um, my question was more about Gen Z. Um, you know, how do we educate the youth with dwindling um, budgets um, and, you know, whole news? Um, how do we <coughs> educate the youth and how do we make them interested in journalism uh, moving forward? Who wants truth? <laughs> well, I'll take the, the second part. Oh, I can take the second part. <laughs> okay, sure. take, you guys do Gen Z, I'll well, do truth. Okay, okay. Good. <laughs> well, I was just going to say on the how do you get people engaged in journalism? I mean, I, you know, as you're saying, journalism. I think you mentioned this in your yeah. intro that the you know, applications to journalism school are up, and I actually think if there's any positive effect of all this debate over you know uh, attention to reporting and fake news and whatever when you're part of the sort of spotlight of the media. It just gets people interested. And I actually think there's quite a lot of um, young people who think this, you know, are interested in doing media in some fashion. And almost every young person, right, is, a, is some sort of content creator in their own right and has a sort of voice that they've cultivated. And, and that's what we're actually in, in um, newsrooms are trying to reflect, trying to give ourselves, that we have sort of devoiced ourselves for so long, give ourselves more voice now. And so I actually think there's a real space for, for Gen Z or whatever you want to call it to to come in, and I, I, I am actually not, um, I, there, we've had a lot of new young hires recently who are quite good, and I think that's just, I, I'm not, I'm encouraged by who's coming in. I'm not, I don't think there's a dearth, I think there's actually a, there's too many people who want to work in journalism right now. Yeah, I mean, I think, I think the fact that a lot of the, the technology has made um, anybody potentially a reporter, minus the actual kind of, uh, you know, commitment to kind of the fundamental ethos of what reporting is, but you can kind of report a story with this device and do it in a really creative way. YouTube becomes a really exciting platform. Same thing with Twitter, Facebook, Snapchat, and the like. And I think that just means, you know, it becomes more accessible and it's less, you know, um, ink on, on dead trees, uh, which is how a lot of people, essentially young people, perceived kind of the, the newspaper for, for many years. And it became something once you, you know, bought a house or got married, you would kind of graduate into as a life stage. Now it's a lot of that consumption is happening earlier. Um, I also say some of the media literacy programs that you know, are, are happening now, um, Pointer is, is doing one uh, funded through a Google.org uh, commitment, as Facebook and others have done things. I think that at least is going to, it's not going to solve the problem by any stretch of the imagination, but it may identify some potentially useful um, ways to engage uh, young people and actually help them become better news consumers. Because clearly, like, you know, you need to be able to think about, you know, what you're reading, uh, how you essentially become um, uh, thoughtful about what is and what isn't accurate, what is and what isn't something you potentially want to share because it's, it's fun versus something that essentially is trying to start a productive conversation. Yeah. Um, so those are at least two angles. Uh, and, and as to your question, so there's this phrase that I learned in journalism school, and I don't always agree with everything Carl Bernstein says, does, or writes, but his idea is journalism is the best available version of the truth. So capital T truth is for novelists and poets. We are here to ask as many people what they saw, how they experienced it. And this goes back to the idea of making journalism more affordable, more inclusive, more diverse, because the best available version of the truth includes reporting. And, and that's the one thing that I think needs to be married with the new technology is like, you can have all the tools in the world, but you actually need to be able to ask someone what they saw and then like ask somebody else and figure out that those versions are gonna be a little different and try to make the best puzzle fit together. And, and so that's the one part of this that actually does, where well, I get nervous. I want people, I want the skill of reporting to not go away because none of the rest of this matters if you can't report a story. Thank you all very much for your great questions and thanks again to the panel.